hi everybody whoever is watching this this is a this is an ad hoc weird serendipitous event <laughs> given my world out there uh who you see on the other side of the screen is a guy named jerry mccoskey and i'll let him introduce himself but i'll first say a couple of words jerry and i met god uh two or three lifetimes ago i think uh i think I think Jerry, you 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 took some of my seminars. You ran across me, but we both ran across the brain. Now I don't know if you did it first and turned me onto it, or I did first and turned you onto it. It didn't matter, but you know. Anyway, that's a lot of what we're going to talk about. But uh, and and this is going to be unique to those of you who are familiar with the brain, or who might be interested in the brain as a piece of software, and we'll hear. Jerry's story about that. Jerry, I, I, you know, I, kind of turned me on to hear your last interview that you did that was quite in depth about, you know, why you're still using the brain after all these, what, 20 years? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and why, but, but even beyond that, whether or not you're interested in that software, but, but Jerry's brain is very uh, fascinating in terms of uh, how he's knitted together and sort of managed his, uh, Oh, I'm going to stop, Jerry. You could tell people much, better, much better, much better than. But but I was fascinated by that, and fascinated by the, the the whole idea of how do we now manage the information world that is so thrown at us. I mean, what's changed is the speed of change and um, and the volume and 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 intensity of data that's coming at us that is available to us. So surfing on top of that, staying sane about that is obviously a huge sort of GTD-esque kind of topic, you know, no matter what. So I'm gonna hit the tennis ball back over the fence. <clears throat> Jerry, tell people uh, who you are, and why you think they might be interested in what you have to say. Oh, thanks. Um, it's really nice to, to have a chance to chat again. It's been, it's been forever. Um, and I think probably I turned you onto the brain because I was on their first press tour. And uh, weirdly, so I used to work for Esther Dyson. I was writing a news, a monthly newsletter and I had chosen the topic, strangely, about bookmark management and mind mapping. And those two things don't normally go together on people's menus, but I was busy trying to figure out like URLs seem really important. Why are they so hard to manage? Like the, the, the bookmark feature in your browser sucks. You put a hundred things in there, you've lost everything. It's, it's impossible to manage. So what else might you use? And I was totally frustrated with everything I'd seen. And then this little company sends me a, an unsolicited email because I was on the press tour for anybody who was launching or launching some software because my boss Esther had a big audience and everybody wanted Esther to write about them. And I was at the front door going, hello, I get to write about you. And so I'm totally frustrated because the companies I, I found just, I didn't like what they had. And then this brain thing shows up and I'm like, at the moment the inventor opens his laptop sitting next to me, I'm like, this thing. I th somehow my brain works like this thing. And I started using it and I'm still using it to this day. Um, and I'm approaching. And half by the way, did you meet did you meet Harlan back then? Uh, Harlan was the demo. He was he he yeah, uh, yeah. so Harlan had met a, a movie producer who became the CEO of the company at the time. And so uh, Doug Block, I think he was at the head of the table and he's thumbing a deck because this is in the days of like paper deck where, where people show up to pitch. He thumbs the deck and he, he looks at me and he says, he has this great intuition. He says, I have a feeling we should go straight to the demo. And Harlan's sitting to my left with his laptop and opens his laptop and starts demoing the brain, which does not look much different right now. One of the beefs against the brain is that it looks like Windows 95 and yep, check. That's, that's so totally true. Um, and he starts demoing this thing, which is a mind map, and and you and I are, are intimately familiar with it, um, as are I don't know dozens of other people on the planet, certainly thousands, but not you know it hasn't eaten the world. But I found that I could really speak, I could express myself in this tool. Started using it, still use it today, and have never had a second brain file. So one of the oddities here is that I've been feeding a single mind map for 24 years, and it has almost a half million thoughts in it. Each node is called a thought, connected by over 900,000 links. So I'm approaching a million links, all put in by hand by me. I don't do any automation. I don't, I don't sick it on a website and say, crawl this thing or anything like that. And so, um, so that's just a piece of the background. And that, that's like a, our big overlap, because I've been thinking about this call for a little bit, uh, and I... 
I, I kind of wanted to say really early that I feel like I'm the antimatter David Allen. Like where you personify getting things done and efficiency and productivity and all of that, I am just nowhere in that space. I am, you know, I have a whole series of initiatives. I, my brain is like this space where I'm curious about everything. And if you wander around through the half million things I put in there, uh, it's everything from cocktail recipes to why Donald Trump uh, is Donald Trump and how he works to uh, completely, you know, apolitical things as well. Uh, By the way, so let, let me stop you right there. Yeah. People, people listening or watching this right now. Uh, Again, it's a piece of software called The Brain, current edition of the brain, the brain 12, I believe. And it's something I've been using for, I got 20 years, I guess, since Jerry, we, we, we connected. And I, I probably have about 10,000 entries in there. Jerry's got, you know, he just said that, that many in there. And I haven't used it as a rigorous tool. I used it as a fun, uh, serendipitous tool which has been very, very useful in random moments just to see who else lives in Dayton, Ohio. Let me look. And, you know, there it is, or at least I've, where I've been able to capture it and I've input the less stuff and I'm still using it. So it's still a very viable part. It's a, you know, I hit the, whatever and I hit the brain and it shows up and, and I can add stuff to it. So um, the pieces, the software itself um, well, let me, let me toss it back to you, Jerry. That's, that's what we're talking about is that piece of software that actually tended to map, uh, how our brain tends to work. The, the creator Harlan, uh, you know, was, he said, I need to create software that, that thinks the way I think. And he did, <laughs> which is that thought reminds me of that thought, which reminds me of that thought. Oh, by the way, that turns to that thought. Well, wait a minute. I had that thought before. What else is related to that thought? And he designed an elegant tool, which is still highly functional in that regard. So let me toss it back to you and say, okay, now, now maybe more people that are not necessarily aware of what this piece of software is, uh, you can tell them what's unique about it or why you're still using it. Happy to. And I think it makes sense for me to screen share just because we're talking about a visual thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here's you in my brain, and I, I don't think I've updated you very much uh, since back then, but somehow I learned that uh, John Roger was one of your uh, ins inspirations. Uh, he was mm -hmm. also one of Ariana Huffington's inspirations, apparently, uh, that you talk a lot about open loops, psychic RAM, et cetera, et cetera. So I've got a, a bunch of things in here. And then uh, here's now, I always have up at the top, there's a pin board. Anything you put up there stays there. And this is like the winter of our discontent that we're living through right now. And I've been tracking the COVID uh, problem. Here's the Delta variant. Here's Omicron. Here's lineage uh, B dot whatever, the Omicron variant, et cetera. This is, this is the thing we're talking about. Uh, anywhere you see a little fave icon uh, attached to a thought, that means there's a web link. And if you click on this particular web link, it launches your browser to that page. Uh, wherever it is on the inner tubes. And so this is like this, this great memory map for what is going on uh, in the world. So I'll, I'll stop the screen, screen share there just, just to have put the brain in the conversation. But uh, one of the, uh, one of the unique, unique things about you, and this is just about you, Jerry, is you've just made your life transparent to the world because- I publish anybody, my brain for free online. That's right. So I tell people, as long as they're, they may hop off right after this and go surf you. But so how do people get online with you? Which would be how awesome. <laughs> yeah. okay, so, so I own the domain jerrysbrain.com. Funny enough, I also own insidejerrysbrain.com and pickjerrysbrain.com for different reasons. But if you go Jerry's, to Jerry's no, 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 no apostrophe, just an S. No apostrophe, no space, exactly. And Jerry with a J. Um, but at jerrysbrain.com, it says launch Jerry's brain. Click on that. It'll open a new tab and then take you into the brain. And there's a little search field and you can just type in whatever thing. You don't have to traverse the brain. It has a really nice search engine, although on the web server, that little search is a little slower. But I've been publishing my brain openly for, I don't know, at least 15, if not 20 of those 24 years for, you know, since Harlan started making that available. And it's really interesting because I feel kind of like I'm vulnerable in showing exactly what I, you can certainly derive my political inclinations and everything else and what I care about. I'm sort of uh, protected by obscurity because nobody really knows I'm out there. <laughs> um, but it's a really, but it's a lovely exercise in, so 
the thing, my passion project now is called Open Global Mind. And it starts from the thing you just pointed to, which is thinking in public and putting my reasoning in public. And I wish more people did this, not in the brain necessarily, because the brain doesn't work for everybody. Like lots of people look at it and they just see a ball of twine of words, <clears throat> right? Um, other people love Kumu. Some people love Rome research. There's a cult of Rome going on right now that's pretty active. But subtle custom is another way of organizing your thoughts. I'm trying to figure out an open global mind. What does the space look like where all these tools can meet and collaborate? And what does a conversation look like where somebody else has elaborated why they think what they think and what they would do right now with some evidence and some logic and some choices and some whatever, like how do we model that for each other so that we can think together in the public space? And why we, this, we, uh, yeah, and, and why this so rang my bell back in, golly, when did I do this? Uh, 19... 91, I think I drew a sort of an ideal scene mind map for myself. And part of that was just, I was drawing pictures using colored pens. And one of it was, I drew a picture of the globe and the world connected sort of electronically with the small towns. I thought if the small towns could sort of get what I teach or what they teach, what they've learned, how do they manage their own small community and share that with all the other small communities. And I've waited for a long time to watch whether something like that would actually show up or not. And I don't know what all the barriers have been, economic, political, cultural, check, God knows check, why. Check. Yeah, why, why all of that is not there. That's why I think, you know, yay, Jerry, <laughs> what do we do? How do we get, you know, every small town, you know, to yeah. get, either onto the brain or to, to find some collaborative tool to say, look, here's how we handled sewage in our town. Here's how we handled diversity in our town. Here's how we handled transportation in our town. Here's how we handle whatever. And everybody's got all those resources they could use if they were interested. Exactly. I, they, they could probably get it now. I mean, any, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a Google world, you know, so you could probably find a lot of information if you were, if you cared about that, but to have a community, that sort of built itself around the sharing of that kind of information. That's what turned me on to that, that last uh, podcast I heard you do, Jerry. Yeah, which, thank you. Which I just don't see, I, I, I don't see it yet. What do we need to do? Well, it's funny, the brain has perennially had this uptake problem. People see it and they're like, oh, that's cool. And then not that many people stick, right? I, I saw it and I was like a duck in water. I really didn't need any coaching. I was, I was off and running and I'm, I'm, I'm weird that way, right? Um, my, one of the questions in the back of my head is, hey, there seem to be billions of people who are really comfortable using TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram and Tumblr and Pinterest and Facebook, and they're really smart at using hashtags and hashtags are sophisticated metadata. That's really cool. Like that's really rich, except what they're doing is they're showing you like the, the makeup haul they got from the store or the toast they had this morning or whatever. And I'm like, okay, okay. We've, and my whole journey for the last 30 years also starts from me realizing I don't like the word consumer. And so we've consumerized our interest and our attention and all of that when we actually need to be citizens again, instead of consumers and come back into sitting together to figure out how do we solve our problems together. Like yeah, engage, in, in, engagers. Exactly, exactly. And so I have a, there's a thought in my brain called uh, revitalizing uh, cities. And um, here I collect stories from all around the world of cities, you know, Bogota, uh, Curitiba, Brazil, uh, Barcelona, wherever, uh, Todd Morden. Uh, so, uh, oops, let me click up here, Todd Morden uh, in England, where they have edible landscapes because Pam War Warhurst did a TED talk uh, way back in, I don't know what year, I'll, I'll look it up. But she talks about how they revitalize their city by changing all of the rose bushes into edible, like, like lime trees. And that's really interesting. It's, it's a resource, it's a story to tell that if people in small cities around the world go, like just if they had a, an easy a possibility to go sift through stories of how other cities have revitalized themselves, they might go, nope, 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 that one. And how do we do this? Who else could help us? Hey, is the person who did this available to talk to? Because it costs nothing to talk through the inner tubes. All of that, if we can make that available, I think we can sort of help people work their way out of whatever whatever situation they're in. By the way, do you know Jim Fallows? Do you and Jim? I do. I know he's right. written about he's written about me and my brain in in, in uh, the Atlantic several times. 
Oh yeah. Well, you know, his book, Our Towns, you know, is all he about He and his wife that. flew around in their small plane and visited yeah. cities. And, yeah, he and, Deborah, yes. he and Deborah Great. So I, I assume you have that <laughs> that resource, you know, connected in there. Yay. Okay. Um, I ha hadn't thought about going back and talking to him right now and at this moment, but it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so what do we do about this, right? We're both... So what do we do about this? I, 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 at my age, Jerry, come on, 76, just turned 76, and, and there are not that many things I'm that interested in, you know, in, in the world. But you're still quite, you know, uh, rigorously engaged, you know, in terms of all of this stuff and what it could mean and what you could do about it. Uh, all I could do is recommend the brain to people that could that they could start on the same kind of journey for themselves. You know, where do I put a recipe and and oh lettuce? What about lettuces? You know, I know a certain kind of lettuce. Ding. And then people actually get engaged in doing it. I think one of the reasons people that, that there's no uptake is it's it actually requires uh sorry, anybody listening or watching this, it requires thinking. <laughs> Thinking is hard work. People think they're thinking all the time. All they're doing is mentally rehearsing a bunch of stuff. They're not actually thinking. And so this just requires you to think, well, what would that connect to? And why would I need that? And what would be interesting about that? But no, you know, no, the, no, people are thinking. Like, like, what's interesting is people you think are dumb are actually, when you hit the thing they give a damn about, whether it's baseball and baseball stats or cocktail recipes or, or how to make a great yard, they're encyclopedic they're analytic they're they're like they they dig they've they've done their research they know what's going on they're working hard at at, at the thing right the problem is that when they then come up against some thorny problem that looks immovable in society or in their in their neighborhood or they lack resources or whatever they're not interested in tackling that problem and they don't see that other people are around to tackle it with them so they go back to the baseball thing because it, re it rewards the mechanisms, right? So a piece of this is, is not that humans can't think, it's that we're not tuning our thinking sort of in, in the right ways. And part of my narrative is we're also, we've turned into consumers by being treated as mere consumers. We've just turned into consumers who want instant gratification. And we need, need to come back in and, and start. One of the things I like about feeding the brain is that it shifts me from system one thinking to system two thinking. This is- uh, Tell me about, fast. tell me about that. Yeah, so um, this is Thinking Fast and Slow by uh, Kahneman and Tversky, right. uh, actually by, by Kahneman. Uh, and it, he says that system one is your, your automatic response. It's your knee-jerk instinctive response to an answer. And then system two is when logic kicks in. And then you're like, oh, okay, wait, wait. My instinctive answer was wrong. I need to actually piece this together and make sense out of it. And feeding my brain, which I do every day all the time, if you do the math, I'm adding 50 or 60 things to my brain every single day. Um, to put something in, it's like, is this thing worth remembering? What is it? Where do I put it? What do I call it? Do I rename it? What else is it connected to? Just like you were saying earlier, ooh, you know, did you know that Brussels sprouts and broccoli and gailan and all those things are all the same damn plant, right? It just like, it, it was bred differently and grows differently. That's really kind of interesting and going on from there, right? And so I think there's this possibility to help bring people back in to talk about difficult issues and we have to overcome our, our learned helplessness and our idea that these are hyper objects, that these are problems too big to actually even deal with and come back into community and start talking to people who think differently from us. All of those things matter a whole big bunch. But a piece of open global mind is not about the geeky mind mappy tools, but is about open-mindedness and about being vulnerable and present and tr building trust and creating safe spaces where difficult conversations can happen. And I don't know that we're good at that in OGM yet, but we're, we're, we're like really aiming there because for me, the global crisis is partly that we're not dealing with big global crises, but partly it's because we're frozen. We're fearing the other half of the population worldwide. This is not a US phenomenon. This is a global thing. And this is being done intentionally. So, so I think we're in the middle of a plot of, hey, how do we get, make people become critical thinkers? But so much of that is because we've been pulled away from being citizens and being mutually responsible for our outcomes and our futures and our towns and our neighborhoods. All of that is, 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 is like one big thorny package. And I think that there's a, a moment here. We're in this moment of the great resignation, the big quit, the big rethinking of what we're doing. Um, I've got a thought in my brain I can show you called, uh, we're involuntarily renegotiating the social contract worldwide. 
right? And, you know, and that it, moment is an opportunity. It's a huge opportunity. Back to you. Well, one of the reasons that I moved to and love the Netherlands so much is it for 600 years, it had to train itself to think globally and to integrate and to diversify because the God here is money. And the way you make money is you are merchants and you right. merchant merchandise the world, which the Dutch, the Dutch did, you know. Uh, but at the same time, it then became this sort of global uh, network. I think statistically, Amsterdam is the most uh, diverse city in the world in terms of how I think there are 172 different nationalities that are resident in, in the Netherlands. I don't, I don't, I don't know, some, some number like that. So, you know, this is a place that has that sort of idea of integration, that idea of let's find out how this works, how that works, how that works, how that works. And, you know, Eindhoven, you know, in the southern part of the Netherlands has more patents than any other place in the world per person. You know, it's where Phillips, you know, started, whatever. So the Dutch are very quirky. They're very smart. They're very clever. If it ain't Dutch, it ain't much, they say. You know, That's funny. And, so, <laughs> and so interestingly that there might be air islands where this kind of thing, I would imagine the kind of thing is sort of going on, Jerry. I mean, come on, this, you can't be some voice totally crying in the wilderness, right? Right now, there right? Totally, there are totally communities all over the place busy doing this, but we're not connected to each other. And we don't, mm. our, tools, our tools don't connect, our efforts don't connect. And a piece of what I'm trying to do in OGM is become a kind of a bridge or a butterfly or a connector of sorts uh, between them. Have you read the book Amsterdam? Well, uh, Shorto's history? Uh, this one. Uh, yes, Russell Shorto. Yeah, sure. Where he talks twice, about her twice. <laughs> okay, good. Where he talks about herring buses and how Machis herring, yeah. uh, because they, they invented gibbing. And so Machis herring becomes the, the thing that juices prosperity and how Holland sure. basically uh, misses feudalism. Because have you read his, his? Did you read his first book? And, I did not. Or, uh, the island of the city of the world, or the island in the center of the world, the history of Manhattan. Why did you get so in, interested in Amsterdam? Because it was New Amsterdam. And um, so I did not know that. So I've got his book in here, but I didn't uh, haven't actually read it. Now I now I need to. You no, know, it's it is fascinating. I read it after I read Amsterdam, because it gives so much backdrop. A lot of the U.S. culture, by the way, came out of New York, not out of the not out of New England. Everybody yeah. thinks in the history books that it was all New England. People came yeah. to New England for for religious freedom, but they got burned at the stake as witches, and so they all went to to New Amsterdam, which was freewheeling and fun and <laughs> no rules or whatever. And the British, once they traded Suriname for Manhattan, <laughs> kept all the systems that the Dutch had set up because they worked. Right. So a whole lot of the U.S. culture, actually, which was fascinating. That's why you'll 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 be fascinated by by Russell's first book. You know, I was too. You know, about uh, because they it was new data. They, they it was new historical data. They didn't know somebody uncovered a whole lot of the Dutch, uh, the old Dutch language documents. Somehow it wound up in some cache in New York, in the capital of New York, and Albany. In Albany, sorry. And mm -hmm. some guy had wound up, you know, making his PhD, you know, studies, this old Dutch language. And they found him, they found all these documents, and he spent the last 40 years uncovering how much wow. stuff was going on, you know, in New Amsterdam. That was actually just a mirror, because this was the 1640s, 1650s. This was the golden age, you know, in, 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 uh, Holland. in, in, in Holland. Yeah. And... Anyway, so we could go on and on about that. No need to, but I just well, uh, no need to. Except, I adore histories like that. And and like back when I was like thirty five, John Taylor Gatto turned me on to the first good history book I ever read, which was *Tragedy and Hope* by Carol Quigley, which mm -hmm. is about the history of the world's financial system. And it's published in nineteen sixty six, the middle of the Cold War, kind of. So it tells you like what kind of what happened behind the curtain. I'm like, oh, that's really really interesting. And so. When you find a good history book like Amsterdam and now the island at the center of the world, which I must read, what I try to do is debrief that into my brain so that I can share it out so that I can track back and then tell stories around it. And these stories wind up getting sort of animated, reified, whatever. They're, they're made more, hopefully, 
more visible and palpable. And then you start to see the connections and the threads. So I uh, will connect this to the Dutch golden age. Um, you know, I, 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 have you seen the movie Admiral? No. Uh, it's about uh, the, the most, uh, most famous admiral of the Dutch fleet. And it's, it's phenomenal. It's like super, super interesting uh, alongside all of this. Anyway, but, but, but history is so important to us as we're talking about our, our present because we often don't know enough history and we pull the wrong historical analogies out when in fact there's like richer, more interesting ones we can go look for. Yeah, well, what turned me on to intellectual history instead of philosophy was reading Oswald Spengler's The Decline of the West. So, you know, of course, in a very Germanic way, we talked about, you know, all the, I think the nine cultures around the world that had their own DNA that affected the architecture, the art, the, the, the science, the, the, the everything that went on in that culture had this signature, you know, of... Uh, Oh, there we go. Oswald Spengler, The Time of the West. So, but I've not read the book. But I've not read the book. So here's... Yeah. Um, and the West is still in decline, which is weird, isn't it? Well, interesting. You know, he, he was the guy who basically sort of said, look, the West is in the, same, is in the same position that the Roman Empire was, where it was falling apart. Right. So I think there'd be a whole new configuration or, or, or re rethink of that you know given what's going on because there is no more west exactly well there there is to some degree but you know west is everywhere but it, but again where the tao come from where did gothic cathedrals come from where did the whole russian plain you know idea of we're all we're all sort of equal in the, the whatever that became communism i mean this was fascinating stuff to me i nobody we didn't even use the verb paradigm back then you know, but then it became, you know, then a popular idea of, wow, well, there's a paradigm here in this culture that then is impacting on how anybody thinks, you know, and what they perceive. Uh, partly why I care a lot about these things we're talking about is that is I've, I've sort of focused it on this thought in my brain, which is we are in a titanic battle over the narratives in our heads. And by the way, we've always been that this is a, a major force in human history is that is that for long stretches of time, several hundred years at a time, we think that people are lazy. We think that people are evil. We think that those people eat their children, whatever it might be. And these narratives are mostly planted in our heads by people who are, are creating um, the power structures, whatever else. And we're all of us kind of peasants suffering from those power dynamics, right? We like, like those, those things kind of run the larger waves of history that run over us uh, in different ways and create civilizations you either want to be a citizen in or not. Do you know Rutger Bregman's book, uh, Humankind? I've uh, not read it, but I've got it, of course, in my brain. Well, believe me, you know, his, it's a huge rant about sensationalism in the press and how that has so reframed or that has so it importantly uh, poisoned you know, people's perception of our culture and collaboration, cooperation, goodness. You know, it's really a fascinating book. And so I've not read it, but I've already put it under. People are naturally social and collaborative. Humans are altruistic cooperators and people are generally more trustworthy than we think they are, which is a major piece of my thesis. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. I, I, I coined something I call design from trust <clears throat> back in 2012, uh, which to me is a, maybe an advancement of design thinking and like, if only we designed more of our, inf our of our systems from trust, we might have solved some of these problems. Speak, speak to that some more. I didn't understand that totally when I heard your last podcast about that. So yeah. give maybe some examples, samples. Uh, so the easiest use cases is, or whatever. Yeah, the easiest example is Wikipedia because almost everybody's touched it now. So I say like, who who remembers the first time they looked at Wikipedia? Everybody raises their hand. Uh, who remembers the first time they realized how Wikipedia works? And then a bunch of people raise their hand. And it's like, didn't you have this like sphincter tightening moment where it's like, wait, it's certain, certainly the encyclopedia we're all referring to can't be editable by any asshole on earth, right? Certainly that that's not a thing. And yet that's how the system works because it's designed from trust because the key is in the front door and they then deal with bad actors once the actors are inside, but they're busy inviting people in to co-edit which is the ethos of how wikis work, right? And if you go deep in, deeper into the history of how wikis work, and it turns out that Ward Cunningham, who's the inventor of wikis, lives here in Portland. 
And so every now and then uh, we'll get together. But, but there's a whole ethos about believing that people are more trustworthy than we think they are, and then designing systems that start from there, instead of believing that just about everybody's a potential, potential bad actor, and then building a system that defends itself against them. In which case, what you start doing is you start building preventions, limits, coercions, and our, our educational system, the compulsory education system is a great example of a system which could be abundant because anybody can be your teacher. You could learn from any object. You could, you could spend a month on this pen and learn a whole bunch of stuff about whether it's geometry or literature or, or chemistry or you know who knows what, right? Um, and yet we've designed a coercive system because we industrialized learning. And, and so, so in some sense, design from trust is a way of rethinking a variety of systems and institutions uh, so that people can actually step in and take responsibility and begin collaborating toward better results. And so, these systems are, 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 their systems are cheaper and reconnect us, except they're also really counterintuitive because we're so far down the other rabbit hole. They feel really dangerous. So compare this, it, it might be a really bad comparison, but all the freebie software that people use that then sell upgrades you know, to get the pro version or whatever, that is all shareable and you can, you can do all that. So it, is that just a sort of a, a minor consumer, <laughs> consumer-esque you know, version of what you're talking about? So freemium is just a, a business model, right? I'll get people to try my thing. And, and by the way, if somebody else downloaded my software and goes off and does something with it, it's no cost to me. I'm not supporting them very much. If they're on my server, there's a little cost, but having lots of people is really good for my service. So there's a quid pro quo. Freemium isn't, isn't really necessarily designed from trust. I don't see it sort of fitting in there. However, open source software and the design of the internet are both extremely great examples of design from trust. Because pre in, pre internet, you had to go to the International Standards Organization or the International Telecommunications Union, and be a big entity to propose some change, something you were going to do to the system to add to it. And the internet is this incredibly permissive thing where it's like, hey, IETF, I've I've invented this new protocol that does this weird thing, and lots of people seem to be using it now. Would you like to make it a standard? And they're like, looks great, let's go, right? And so th that's designed from trust. Now a lot of those things don't have a business model around them. So pay what you want, that's designed from trust. And Panera had a, had a, a moment some years ago where they created, I think six or seven restaurants were, which were pay what you want restaurants. And they put, them, they put them in fringe neighborhoods that were between prosperous and not so prosperous neighborhoods on purpose because they wanted the traffic from both areas to sort of to, to, to cross the benefit. And they stopped the experiment for reasons I don't understand. But, but, but the idea of, hey, there's no actual set price here. There's maybe a recommended price, maybe not, but letting people sort of pitch in. And it turns out people believe in fairness. Fairness is like a, this deep thing in human nature. Um, you know, monkey experiments show us that when you give monkey over here more cucumbers than, than I got, I, I'll, I'll get mad. Bring me to a, a fast forward. If how does Jerry Mikowski, you know, spend your day and what keeps fueling your fire in terms of the, doing this stuff? Yeah. So, so it's funny you should ask because I, I just got off a call with some friends who are sort of helping me puzzle through this. I, and when I say I'm the antimatter David Allen, what I mean is <laughs> I've done a really, really crappy job of turning all of this into sort of a way of, of, of just making a living at it. So this open global mind thing is like my white whale and I'm Ahab. I'm trying to figure out how, how do we come together to actually solve problems that matter to us? And there's really kind of no particular business model around it. Uh, we did get some funding from Jim Rutt's Family Foundation, so that, that's good. Uh, but, but I'm busy moving all these little chess pieces forward on the board without really putting all of my energy behind any one of them. And uh, so my, my latest thing, and by the way, anybody who's listening can join Open Global Mind, just ping me or go to the website, openglobalmind.com and click on some links and you'll be in our conversations. Um, but pick Jerry's brain is kind of the way I'm going right now because I love being in thoughtful conversations like this one where I'm sharing what I've discovered and kind of squirreled away in this weird artifact called the brain because it actually often enhances the conversation. And you know, in a, in a good conversation, I can send somebody links to different points in my brain where there's all sorts of either opinionated statements with some backing, some evidence, or resources to go uh, look up or whatever else, right? 
Um, and the more I curate that artifact, the more sort of the richer it becomes, the more I have to share back. So, so what I do every day is funny. It's, it's a, you know, too many, too many calls with too many subgroups um, uh, working on all these different moving parts. As I recall, Jerry, when we had breakfast on Shattuck Avenue in Berkeley, God, can you remember the year? Got to be um, 1990 no. something, probably. I don't know. Yeah, it, early it feels 90s. Like a way long time ago. Yeah, Ni early 90s. Anyway, I think you you were you'd been in a lot of what you were doing was sort of organizing these ad hoc events, which I love. An ad hoc event where you invite people who don't have time to show up, and there's no agenda, and then you see what, and then you see what happens. So, so in nineteen, <laughs> yeah, in 1996, I invented Jerry's Weekend Retreats, which, I'll, which I last, I haven't run for the last six years, but pretty much every year from '96 until six years ago, I ran an 80 to 90 person event with no agenda, invite only. And regularly, half the people who showed up were newbies, had never been to one, and were rolling the dice on this weird sounding thing. <laughs> and then the other half were like, you know, perennial retreaters. Uh, and we would talk about whatever showed up. And sometimes 20 minutes before some block of time, you know, the venue we had said, well, this is when we serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And that, that was our structure. And, I, and people were trusting me to figure out what the next piece of, of our activity would be. And I tried not to send us off into breakouts too often, but, but the result is like a really interesting community that's, that's heard each other and seen each other go through these, these you know, interesting and not very structured moments, which is um, totally fun. So, um, so that was not, I was breaking even doing that. I couldn't afford to like, you know, host everybody for free, but I would charge what it cost me to, to put on. Um, and again, I haven't done one of those for five or six years. Well, in the virtual world, there'd be probably some some virtual version of that. I would kind think. of the kind of these open global mind conversations are a virtual piece of that. Yeah, although although I'm not using uh, you know a jury's retreat methodology for them, but but my I'm really comfortable opening a conversation with who shows up uh, with a general idea of where we're going, and then like slowly wading into the deeper waters. And I'm I, and over and over and over again like. 45 minutes into a call, you feel like in barbershop quartet singing, apparently there's some, something called the bird, which is when the four people singing hit the right harmony, there's an overtone, which is almost like a fifth voice. Wow. And, and, and I, I call these moments in sort of group conversation, like the bird in conversation. Um, mm -hmm. And then, and which is why I like kind of 90 minute calls more than 60 minute calls, because if you're gonna like go 45 minutes in and suddenly start humming, um, you kind of want that. You want want that to last. Um, so anyway. Um, so what? What? If there were somebody listening or watching this right now, who would be the most interesting or ideal person for you to sort of catch what you're talking about? If they, if they were this kind of person, or they had this kind of resource, or they were interested in doing this kind of thing, what would be your ideal? you know, uh, audience person for what yeah, you've been exactly. talking about. So there's there's um, different ways I can frame your question, which lead me to different ideal people. So okay. one of those ideal people is a lot of my thinking is really upside down. The, the design from trusting comes out of realizing that we stop trusting humans. And if you can flip that in your head, you start having all these creative ideas about how to fix stuff. You start finding, finding, which I've curated in my brain, hundreds of stories of that actually happening in the world in different ways. You start realizing that there's some general principles for that. So one ideal person is somebody who's trying to like flip the script in their industry, in their company, in whatever it is that they do, and would like to think that through and figure out where to go with that. And that that's like really juicy because <clears throat> I think Every institution is sort of ripe for redesign. A reason there are protests in the streets everywhere, from Cacerolazos to uh, Occupy to Trumpism to everything else, is that people are really pissed off that the system is broken and not serving them well. They're truly angry and for many good reasons. And so anybody who wants to redesign those systems, that's one path. Another path is this critical thinking, let's think together, let's solve local problems question, right? Um, and then the simplest perfect person is somebody who wants to test their ideas or break their ideas and pick Jerry's brain. I'm trying to design that, pickjerrysbrain.com. I'm trying to design that to actually help people 
um, broaden their thinking around whatever their presenting issue is and say, well, have you considered that um, this thing over here happened way back when and is kind of a really interesting lesson for you or maybe a model? Or did you know that these five startups failed to do what you're trying to do? And this is what I know about how they failed, right? Those kinds of things, because I've got the skeletons and the stories buried in my brain as well. Uh, partly I think because I, heard, I, I watched yeah. software for so many years. I, I think I heard you say, there were 300 calendar apps that failed <laughs> something like that I thought, yeah well understood they they never got it right yeah. exactly and today we've got calendly and savvy cal and a, a bunch of others making you know making their way and 20 years from now one or two of those will have won at least temporarily the way facebook you know beat friendster and everybody else and has won facebook has more average monthly users than the populations of India and China together. That's, that's like really, really hard for me to wrap my head around. Right. And yet, <laughs> yeah. and, and yet, and yet we don't treat them as a nation and we like, they don't, they're not under any compulsion to tell anybody anything they do or, or whatever. It's very, very interesting how we got ourselves into this situation. What do you think about all the stuff going on in the media now? And it's about all the, you know, the evil empires of all the big tech, you know, companies and then allowing all kinds of things going on through their media, you know, that, 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 you know, support or promote not optimal behaviors out there in the world. Yeah, exactly. Your, yeah. Um, well, it, it, partly it's complicated, which I guess is a natural answer here, but um, misinformation is really hard to separate from parody, from satire, from a bunch of other kinds of things. So it's actually not that straightforward to find, isolate and get rid of people who intentionally are coming in and spinning tales. And spinning tales is a really powerful te technique or strategy, right? That it really kind of works. Um, second, we allowed a company to sort of step in uh, and build a business model that depends on addicting us to the platform and selling off our information. Those are the revenue sources. And one question I have, like, Let's pretend that the Department of Justice succeeds against Facebook the way it succeeded against Microsoft way back when. What are the remedies? What would you ask Facebook to do? Should they sell off WhatsApp and Instagram? I think that's dumb. That's not gonna fix anything. Uh, my remedy is, what if Facebook were designed around citizens instead of consumers? And right now it's designed entirely as a consumer mass marketing exercise with all of the repercussions I just mentioned, right? All of the, yeah. the, the knock-on effects. What if they had to redesign the platform for citizens and citizenship and us being together and building a shared memory together? So for me, the meta metaverse, the, the, the thing that Zuckerberg showed would have looked stupid in 1995. Like, 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 like the, the, the examples he gave were just silly. But this brain thing I'm wandering around, it is also kind of a metaverse, except it's just me sitting there curating my own brain because the tool is not that great at the, at the shared brain thing. Um, so what does this shared memory look like? And maybe companies like Facebook and Google and others could help us know what we know together because we don't know what we know. We're stuck. Fascinating idea. Okay, I'm gonna call it the end of this. Uh, Jerry, anything else you wanna share with the whatever listening universe that might be listening to? you know, to me in this conversation, anything else you'd like to have people know either about you or what you're doing or what do you think I, they should do? I think only um, that I'm, I'm sort of a, a, a pessimistic cynic in the short term and an optimist in the long run, because I think humans are actually like better than we think they are. I think we're going to find our way through this thing. And a lot of how we find our way through this thing is the conversation we just had. If, if, if some, if some people are inspired or motivated by any of these kinds of energies to, to come together and think together as citizens again, to rebuild trust, to redesign our institutions from trust, for example, those are, I think those are, those are awesome things to work on. And if people wanted to get in touch with you, I know you've mentioned several different uh, touch points in terms of getting into what you're doing, but if somebody said, oh God, I got to talk to, I'd love to talk to Jerry directly. How would, is that okay? And how would they do that? That's totally okay. Um, go to LinkedIn and find me and friend me and mention David Allen. Like, like I, I, if somebody just says, if, if they click on the default connect, I normally say no. But if, if they register any kind of like awareness of who I am as a human, I'll say yes. Uh, my Twitter handle is Jerry, is my first name, last name. So uh, at Jerry Mikulski, I'm actually Twitter user number 509. 
And I didn't realize when I signed up that having a really short name would be a good thing. So <laughs> dumb, but, but I'm the 509th person to sign up for it. Uh, and then, you know, I Google pretty well, so you can find me. Yay. Thank you, Jerry. This has been yeah, fun. You. And let's, uh, let's do a, a version, you know, 2.0 sometime. I'd love okay. it. This yeah. has been great. And, 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 and hear what's happened. So uh, thanks very much. Be safe. <laughs>